You are now watching Tales from the Grid. Uh, this is just too weird for me. Originally, this video was going to be about the lack of Zack and Black Ranger products, but it involved into asking who's really to blame for the way the franchise has been treated lately. There's been numerous times where the Black Ranger has been left out of releases. One could assume that a company producing Mighty Morphin items has information that shows that the Black Ranger is not profitable, or the company assumes he won't be profitable. There could be other speculations as to why the Black Ranger has been excluded, but we'll look at this situation through a financial lens. Some companies release the Rangers as a a bundle of 7, 6, or the core 5, and sell the green and white rangers individually or as a separate bundle. There's been releases where companies sell Mighty Morphin items in waves instead of selling the entire team simultaneously. This can be interpreted as the perceived popular rangers getting released first, and once they hit certain sales quotas, the rest of the team gets released. Depending on how many of the 7 Mighty Morphin rangers a company plans to sell, there seems to be default combinations of which rangers make the cut if it's not all 7. Figpin has chosen to sell all 7 and Mighty Morphin Rangers as pins, and they also have a companion app that unlocks additional information once you register a pin. When using information gathered from the app and website, you can get an idea of the number of purchases and registrations. Arranging the Rangers from most to least registered, it's a surprise that the Black Ranger isn't number 6 or 7. Seeing the order of the list makes sense how companies go about the rollout of Mighty Morphin releases where the focus is on which Ranger is going to sell the most. When looking at the same list but adjusting it to the data from the website, it tells a different story. According to the website, the Black Ranger is the least profitable Ranger. Even though this is a somewhat niche product with a low price point, there are takeaways from this data that reflect positively and negatively on the Power Ranger franchise. Thickpin has made 1,000 standard pins of each Mighty Morphin Ranger for $15 per pin. Even if not a fan of wearing pins, for $15 the pin would be a nice addition to a collection. Only the green and white Ranger pins are sold out. The other Rangers are nearing the same status, but you think that a limited run of a $15 item would quickly sell out, but here we are months later and that's not the case. Figpin also makes variants of their standard pins and pins of different sizes, but looking at the sales data, would it be a good investment to make more Mighty Morphin pins or to venture out to other seasons if the most popular team isn't even selling out? One thing to understand is that fans, followers, customers, and consumers are not interchangeable names for the same role. A fan likes the franchise, a follower follows the franchise on social media, a customer buys the franchise's products, and a consumer actually uses the franchise's products. An individual person could be all four of these roles, but that's not always the case. Power Rangers has been around for four decades, while Super Sentai itself has six decades under its belt, so there are plenty of fans out there. Across multiple social media platforms, Power Rangers has a combined minimum of over 10 million followers. Unfortunately, those 10 million followers don't automatically translate into 10 million customers. I'm a fan of Super Sentai, a follower of Power Rangers, a customer of Mighty Morphin, and a consumer for the Black Ranger. Zack's Black Ranger is my favorite Ranger, so when new Mighty Morphin items release, I'm immediately looking for Zack or Black Ranger stuff. Some companies use social media to gauge how much interest a franchise has. If a company sees that Power Ranger followers are mostly talking about Mighty Morphin, then that's the team they're going to focus on when making products. Like most, most people who aren't fans of the show, you ask them what Power Rangers is, and their minds will automatically go to MMPR and those characters. When images of the Mighty Morphin Rangers in mutated form came out, there was a lot of interest on social media for them. I put up a poll on Instagram about the idea of a 10 episode animated series of these mutated Mighty Morphin Rangers and how much fans would be willing to pay to see it. To my surprise, the most chosen answer was zero dollars, it should be free. Social media isn't the end all be all of fan interaction, but that response leads me to believe that a vocal segment of the fan base wants products. But don't want to pay for it. I would have been willing to pay $14.99 or more off the strength of the designs. I would collect their figures too if they were released in the two packs just like the TMNT figures. By 2001, Power Ranger toy sales generated over $6 billion. Power Ranger licensed merchandise sales have averaged over $300 million per year between 2012 and 2018. So when Hasbro got a chance to buy the brand for $522 million, it was an easy decision to make. But let's not get it confused. Hasbro is a company just like any other company whose main objective 
objective is to make money. Since Power Ranger merchandise was making over $300 million a year, Hasbro would have gotten a return on their investment within two years and had another billion dollar franchise under their umbrella in a little over three years. They bought Power Rangers to tap into the merchandise and potential, but somehow the plans didn't fall through as expected based on how Hasbro currently acknowledges Power Rangers. Information from news articles, interviews, and public reports reveal a timeline of events that show how the relationship between Hasbro and the Power Ranger brand got to where it is today. Mighty Morphin Power Rangers premieres. Power Rangers becomes a billion dollar franchise. Bandai America hires Brian Goldner. Brian Goldner prioritizes the bond properties. Brian Goldner joins Hasbro. Brian Goldner promoted to oversee U.S. toy divisions and brands. Brian Goldner promoted to Hasbro CEO. Hasbro acquires Power Rangers Master Toy License. Hasbro acquires Power Rangers. Hasbro classifies Power Rangers as an emerging brand. Hasbro was aware of the financial risk Power Rangers came with. Hasbro releases the Power Rangers Lightning Collection. Three waves were released in 2019. COVID sales gives Power Rangers a sales boost. Hasbro expresses excitement for Power Ranger projects. Brian Goldner goes on medical leave. Brian Goldner passes away. Chris Cox promoted to Hasbro CEO. Hasbro introduces Blueprint 2.0. Blueprint 2.0 devalues the Power Rangers brand. Hasbro sells E1. Money more from Power Rangers once and always premieres. Power Rangers ends production in New Zealand. The popular international TV series Power Rangers is leaving New Zealand after 20 years of production here. Power Rangers Cosmic Fairy premieres. Rumors of a hiatus, break, or pause of the Power Ranger franchise. At least for the time being, the Power Rangers, we're taking a little bit of time off from doing Power Rangers toys as we're kind of figuring out the what's happening next with the brand. Um, so kind of stay tuned for news on Power Rangers. Unfortunately, nothing else that we can add at this point. Hasbro confirms the Power Ranger hiatus, break, pause. The Power Rangers reboot may still be in production. The Weird Egg Productions website has stated that Jenny Klein is currently in an overall deal with E1 to serve as the showrunner and creator of Power Rangers as a one-hour TV series. Based on this timeline, it shows that Brian Goldner championed Power Rangers and believed that it could rise to the status of a franchise brand. Due to Brian's unfortunate passing, Power Rangers lost its biggest advocate. New leadership, financial declines, and the Blueprint 2.0 strategy caused Power Rangers to lose corporate backing and to be deprioritized. Reports and documents also create a timeline of Hasbro's business moves that contributed to the deprioritization of Power Rangers. Based on this timeline, Hasbro tried to increase its earnings by acquiring brands and companies that could help diversify their brand portfolio. Under Brian Goldner's direction, Hasbro's approach was growth over time by developing its brands through different platforms and mediums. After Brian's passing, Hasbro made organizational changes. One of these changes was promoting Chris Cox, a former CEO of Wizards of the Coast, a Hasbro subsidiary which owns Magic the Gathering, to the CEO of Hasbro. He was most likely chosen because during Chris's leadership, Wizards of the Coast surpassed $1 billion in annual sales. Under Chris's direction, Hasbro's approach is to conserve its resources for its more profitable brands, also known as Blueprint 2.0. There's a question as to who's to blame for Power Rangers being put on hiatus. Based on opinions from the online community, Hasbro doesn't care about Power Rangers, which is partially true. Brian Goldner, Hasbro's previous CEO, cared about Power Rangers on a personal and business level, whereas Chris Cox, the current Hasbro CEO, only cares about Power Rangers on a business level. Changes in entertainment strategy due to the implementation of Blueprint 2.0 caused Power Rangers to incur partial impairment charge, making the Power Rangers brand decrease in value. The decrease has had multiple effects on Power Rangers, such as ending production in New Zealand, limiting Cosmic Fairy to 10 episodes instead of 20. It was a board decision within Hasbro not to spend the money for on the 20 episode season. And putting the entire brand on hiatus. Based on information from financial reports, the fans don't financially support Power Rangers, which is partially true. Super 7 had to cancel the Madame Woe and White Tiger Zord figures due to low pre-orders. The White Tiger Zord being cancelled comes as a shock, especially because it's the Zord to arguably one of the most popular Rangers. The minimum order quantity for a $65 White Tiger Zord isn't publicly known, but looking at the Super 7 campaigns, a $650 Cat Slayer needed a minimum 
minimum of $1.95 million in sales to get funded, and succeeded, while a $450 Cobra mothership needed a minimum of $1.8 million in sales and failed. If the White Tigers were needed to meet those type of numbers at $65 apiece, they would have needed about 27.7 thousand pre-orders. If that number is accurate, that means that there's a low amount of financial support within the Power Rangers fan base. Maybe not everybody is into action figures. A look at the official Power Ranger Kickstarter project for board games and comic books also give an insight into what type of support Power Rangers has from its own fan base. The most successful and backed board game raised $750,000 by almost 3,800 backers. The most successful comic book series raised $804,000 and the most backed comic series had more than 5,800 backers. From those numbers alone, it shows that the current financial support from the Power Ranger fan base will not allow the franchise to continue. The future of the Power Ranger brand relies on the relationship between the fans and Hasbro. The fans want product and Hasbro wants money. Hasbro is currently prioritizing its financial support on its franchise brands. Since Power Rangers is still classified as an emerging brand, this means that as of Blueprint 2.0, Power Rangers will be put on hiatus until further notice. Not all hope is lost. The Peppa Pig franchise was also an emerging brand until they did about $163 million in 2021. At the start of 2022, Peppa Pig was promoted to franchise brand status. At Investor Day 2022, Hasbro revealed their new criteria to become a franchise brand, which is to have a plan to reach $500 million or greater in revenue by 2027. If Power Rangers can generate $167 million a year in revenue for the next three years, it'll put the brand back in the forefront. At first, I blame the current state of Power Rangers solely on Hasbro, accusing them of unfair treatment toward the brand. But upon further inspection, it looks like the blame is also on the fans. It doesn't matter how much you love Power Rangers or how many times you post about them on social media. The franchise needs money to survive. Waiting for products you want to go on sale isn't helping because a sale is declare inventory that's not moving and that lets the seller know to not order as much Power Ranger products again. Fans don't have to buy every piece of Power Ranger merch, but if they don't invest in the brand they love, it'll cease to exist. Hasbro also has a hand in this matter because their Power Ranger product releases are very questionable. Along with their quality of figures, Hasbro has also on multiple occasions underutilized their very various channels to advertise new Power Ranger items either they or their licensees have made. When it comes to other brands, they have various combinations of fan, follower, customer, consumer mixes. Unfortunately, when it comes to the Power Ranger brand, the mix is one that can't sustain the brand going forward. Hasbro would be more than happy to sell Power Ranger products, but the fan base has to buy them. The fan base does want products, but Hasbro has to make things the fans actually want. Once that's settled, both sides will be satisfied and Power Rangers will be saved. Thank you for watching another episode of Tales from the grid and until next time have a good one